Chapter 16 of A Series of Lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Rama Sharaka. Chapter 16 The Seventh Lesson The Unfoldment of Consciousness Part 1 We have thought it well to make a slight change in the arrangement of these lessons, that is, in the order in which they should appear. We had contemplated making the seventh lesson a series of mental drills intended to develop certain of the mental faculties. But we have decided to postpone the same until a later lesson, believing that by so doing, a more logical sequence or order of arrangement will be preserved. In this lesson, we will tell you of the unfoldment of consciousness in man, and in the next lesson, and probably in the one following it, we shall present to you a clear statement regarding the states of mind, below and over consciousness, the most wonderful region, we assure you, and one that has been greatly misunderstood and misinterpreted. This will lead up to the subject of the cultivation of the various faculties, both conscious and outside of consciousness, and the series will be concluded by three lessons going right into the heart of this part of the subject, and giving certain rules and instruction calculated to develop man's wonderful thought machine that will be of the greatest interest and importance to all of our students. When the lessons are concluded, you will see that the present arrangement is most logical and proper. In this lesson, we take up the subject of the unfoldment of consciousness. The most interesting subject. Many of us have been in the habit of identifying consciousness with mind, but as we proceed with this series of lessons, we will see that that which is called consciousness is but a small portion of the mind of the individual, and even that small part is constantly changing its states and unfolding new states undreamed of. Consciousness is a word we use very often in considering the science of the mind. Let us see what it means. Webster defines it as one's knowledge of sensations and mental operations, or of what passes in one's own mind. Halleck defines it as that undefinable characteristic of mental states which causes one to be aware of them. But, as Halleck states, consciousness is incapable of definition. To define anything, we are obligated to describe it in terms of something else. And there is nothing else in the world like consciousness. Hence, we can define it only in terms of itself and that is very much like trying to lift oneself by one's own bootstraps. Consciousness is one of the greatest mysteries that confronts us. Before we can understand what consciousness really is, we must know what mind really is. And that knowledge is lacking, notwithstanding the many ingenious theories evolved in order to explain the mystery. The metaphysicians do not throw much light on the subject, and as for materialistic science, listen to what Huxley says. How it comes about that anything so remarkable as a state of consciousness comes about by the result of irritating nervous tissue, is just as unaccountable as the appearance of the genie when Aladdin rubbed his lamp. To many persons, the words consciousness and mental process, or thought, are regarded as synonyms. And in fact, psychologists so held until quite recently. But now it is generally accepted as a fact that mental processes are not limited to the field of consciousness, and it is now generally taught that the field of subconsciousness, that is, under-consciousness, mentation, is of a much greater extent than that of conscious mentation. Not only is it true that the mind can hold in consciousness but one fact at any one instant, and that, consequently, only a very small fraction of our knowledge can be in consciousness at any one moment, but it is also true that the consciousness plays a very small part in the totality of mental processes, or mentation. The mind is not conscious of the greater portion of its own activities. Maudsley says that only 10% comes into the field of consciousness. Taine has stated it in these words. Of the world which makes up our being, we only perceive the highest point, the lighted up peaks of a continent whose lower levels remain in the shade. But it is not our intention to speak of this great subconscious region of the mind at this point, for we shall have much to do with it later on. It is mentioned here in order to show that the enlargement or development of consciousness is not so much a matter of growth as it is an unfoldment, not a new creation or enlargement from the outside, but rather an unfoldment outward from within. From the very beginning of life, among the particles of inorganic substance, may be found traces of something like sensation and response hitherto. Writers have not cared to give to this phenomenon the name of sensation or sensibility, as the term savored too much of senses and sense organs. But modern science has not hesitated to bestow the name so long withheld. The most advanced scientific writers do not hesitate to state that in reaction, chemical response, etc., may be seen indications of rudimentary sensation. Haeckel says, I cannot imagine the simplest chemical and physical process without attributing the movement of the material particles to unconscious sensation. 
The idea of chemical affinity consists in the fact that the various chemical elements perceive the qualitative differences in other elements and experience pleasure or revulsion at contacts with them and execute their specific movements on this ground. He also speaks of the sensitiveness of plasm, or the substance of living bodies, as being only a superior degree of the general irritability of substance. Chemical reaction between atoms is spoken of by chemists as a sensitive reaction. Sensitiveness is found even in the particles of inorganic substance, and may be regarded as the first glimmerings of thought. Science recognizes this when it speaks of the unconscious sensation of the particles as a thesis, or feeling and the unconscious will that responds thereto as tropesis, or inclination. Haeckel says of this that sensation perceives the different qualities of the stimuli and feeling the quantity, and also, we may ascribe the feeling of pleasure and pain in the contact with qualitatively different atoms to all atoms, and so explain the elective affinity in chemistry, attraction of loving atoms, inclination, repulsion of hating atoms, disinclination. It is impossible to form a clear or intelligent idea of the phenomenon of chemical affinity, etc., unless we attribute to the atoms something akin to sensation. It is likewise impossible to understand the actions of the molecules, unless we think of them as possessing something akin to sensation. The law of attraction is based upon mental states and substance. The response of inorganic substance to ele electricity and magnetism is also another evidence of sensation and the response thereto. In the movements and operations of crystal life, we obtain evidences of still a little higher forms of sensation in response thereto. The action of crystallization is very near akin to that of some low forms of plasmic action. In fact, the missing link between plant life and the crystals is claimed to have been found in some recent discoveries of science, the connection being found in certain crystals in the interior of plants composed of carbon combinations and resembling the inorganic crystals in many ways. Crystals grow along certain lines and forms up to a certain size. Then they begin to form baby crystals on their surfaces, which then take on the growth, the processes being almost analogous to cell life. Processes akin to fermentation have been detected among chemicals. In many ways, it may be seen that the beginning of mental life must be looked for among the minerals and particles, the latter, be it remembered, composing not only inorganic but also organic substance. As we advance in the scale of life, we are met with constantly increasing unfoldment of mentation, the simple giving place to the complex manifestations. Passing by the simple vital processes of the monera, or single-celled things, we notice the higher forms of cell life with growing sensibility or sensation. Then we come to the cell groups in which the individual cells manifest sensation of a kind, coupled with the community sensation. Food is distinguished, selected, and captured, and movements exercised in pursuit of the same. The living thing is beginning to manifest more complex mental states. Then the stage of the lower plants is reached, and we notice the varied phenomena of that region, evidencing an increased sensitiveness, although there are practically no signs of special organs of sense. Then we pass on to the higher plant life, in which begin to manifest certain sensitive cells, or groups of such cells, which are rudimentary sense organs. Then the forms of animal life, and considered with rising degrees of sensations and growing sense apparatus, or sense organs, gradually unfolding into something like nervous systems. Among the lower animal forms there are varying degrees of mentation, with accompanying nerve centers and sense organs, little or no signs of consciousness, gradually ascending until we have dawning consciousness in the reptile kingdom, etc., and fuller consciousness and a degree of intelligent thought in the still higher forms gradually increasing until we reach the plane of the highest mammals, such as the horse, dog, elephant, ape, etc., which animals have complex nervous systems, brains, and well-developed consciousness. We need not further consider the forms of mentation and the forms of life below the conscious stage, for that would carry us far from our subject. Among the higher forms of animal life, after a dawn period or semi-consciousness, we come to forms of life among the lower animals possessing a well-developed degree of mental action and consciousness the latter being called by psychologists simple consciousness, but which term we consider too indefinite, and which we will term physical consciousness, which will give a fair idea of the thing itself. We use the word physical in the double sense of external and relating to the material structure of a living being, both of which definitions are found in the dictionaries. And that is just what physical consciousness really is, an awareness in the mind, or a consciousness of the external world as evidenced by the senses, and of the body of the animal or person. 
The animal or person thinking on the plane of physical consciousness, all the higher animals do, and many men seem unable to rise much higher, identifies itself with the physical body and is conscious only of thoughts of that body and the outside world. It knows, but not being conscious of mental operations or of the existence of its mind, it does not know that it knows. This form of consciousness, while infinitely above the mentation of the non-conscious plane of sensation, is like a different world of thought from the consciousness of the highly developed intellectual man of our age and race. It is difficult for a man to form an idea of the physical consciousness of the lower animals and savages, particularly as he finds it difficult to understand his own consciousness except by the act of being conscious. But observation and reason have given us a fair degree of understanding of what this physical consciousness of the animal is like, or at least in what respect it differs from our own consciousness. Let us take a favorite illustration. A horse standing out in the cold sleet and rain undoubtedly feels the discomfort, and possibly pain, for we know by observation that animals feel both. But he is not able to analyze his mental states and wonder when his master will come out to him. Think how cruel it is to keep him out of the warm stable. Wonder whether he will be taken out in the cold again tomorrow. Feel envious of other horses who are indoors. Wonder why he is compelled to be out cold nights, etc., etc. In short, he does not think as would a reasoning man under such circumstances. He is aware of the discomfort, just as would be the man, and he would run home if he could, just as would the man. But he is not able to pity himself, nor to think about his personality, as would the man, nor does he wonder whether such a life is worth living, after all. He knows, but is not able to think of himself as knowing. He does not know that he knows, as we do. He experiences the physical pain and discomfort, but is spared the mental discomfort and concern arising from the physical, which man so often experiences. The animal cannot shift its consciousness from the sensations of the outer world to the inner states of being. It is not able to know itself. The difference may be clumsily illustrated by the example of a man feeling, seeing, or hearing something that gives him a pleasurable sensation, or the reverse. He is conscious of the feeling or sensation, and that it is pleasurable or otherwise. That is physical consciousness, and the animal may share it with him. But it stops right there with the animal. But the man may begin to wonder why the sensation is pleasurable and to associate it with other things and persons, or speculate why he dislikes it, what will follow, and so on. That is mental consciousness, because he recognizes an inward self and is turning his attention inward. He may see another man and experience a feeling or sensation of attraction or aversion, like or dislike. This is physical consciousness, and an animal may also experience a sensation. The man goes further than the animal, and wonders just what there is about the man he likes or detests, and may compare himself to the man and wonder whether the latter feels as he does, and so on. This is mental consciousness. In animals, the mental gaze is freely directed outward, and never returns upon itself. In man, the mental gaze may be directed inward, or may return inward after its outward journey. The animal knows, the man not only knows, but he knows that he knows and is able to investigate that knowing and speculate about it. We call this higher consciousness mental consciousness. The operation of physical consciousness we call instinct. The operation of mental consciousness we call reason. End of chapter 16 Section 17 of A Series of Lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramacharaka Section 17 the man who has mental consciousness not only feels or senses things, but he has words or mental concepts of these feelings and sensations, and may think of himself as experiencing them, separating himself, the sensation or feeling, and the thing felt or sensed. The man is able to think, I feel, I hear, I see, I smell, I taste, I desire, I do, etc., etc., the very words indicate mental consciousness, recognizing mental states and giving them names, and also recognizing something called I that experiences the sensations. This latter fact has caused psychologists to speak of this stage as self-consciousness, but we reserve this idea of the I consciousness for a higher stage. The animal experiences something that gives it the impressions or feeling that we call pain, hurt, pleasant, sweet, bitter, etc., all being forms of sensation, but it is unable to think of them in words. The pain seems to be a part of itself, 
although possibly associated with some person or thing that caused it. The study of the unfoldment of consciousness in a young baby will give one a far better idea of the grades and distinctions than can be obtained from reading mere words. Mental consciousness is a growth. As Halleck says, many persons never have more than a misty idea of such a mental attitude. They always take themselves for granted and never turn the gaze inward. It has been doubted whether the savages have developed self-consciousness, and even many men of our own race seem to be but little above the animals in intellect and consciousness. They do not seem able to know themselves even slightly. To them, the eye seems to be a purely physical thing, a body having desires and feeling but little more. They are able to feel and act, but scarcely more. They are not able to set aside any physical not I, being utterly unable to think of themselves as anything else but a body. The I and the body are one with them, and they seem incapable of distinguishing between them. Then comes another stage in which mental consciousness proper sets in. The man begins to realize that he has a mind, he is able to know himself as a mental being, and to turn the gaze inward a little. This period of development may be noticed in young children. For a time they speak of themselves as a third person, until finally they begin to say I. Then a little later comes the ability to know their own mental states as such. They know that they have a mind and are able to distinguish between it and the body. It is related that some children experience a feeling of terror when they pass into this stage. They exhibit signs of bashfulness and what is commonly termed self-consciousness in that sense. Some tell us in after years that when they became aware of themselves as an entity, they were overcome with alarm, as if by a sense of loneliness and apartness from the universe. Young people often feel this way for several years. There seems to be a distinct feeling that the universe is antagonistic to and set apart from them. And although this feeling of separateness and apartness grows less acute as the man grows older, yet it is always present to a greater or less degree until a still higher stage, the ego consciousness is reached, when it disappears, as we shall see. And this mental conscious stage is a hard one for many. They are entangled in a mass of mental states which the man thinks is himself, and the struggle between the real I and its confining sheaths is painful. And it becomes still more painful as the end is neared, for as man advances in mental consciousness and knowledge, he feels more keenly and suffers accordingly. Man eats the fruit of the tree of knowledge and begins to suffer, and is driven out of the garden of Eden, of the child and primitive races, who live like birds of the air, and concern themselves not about mental states and problems. But there is deliverance ahead in the shape of a higher consciousness, although but few realize it, and still fewer have gained it. Perhaps this lesson may point out the way for you. With the birth of mental consciousness comes the knowledge that there is a mind in others. Man is able to speculate and reason about the mental states of other men because he recognizes these states within himself. As man advances in the mental consciousness, he begins to develop a constantly increasing degree and grade of intellect, and accordingly he attaches the greatest importance to that part of his nature. Some men worship intellect as a god, ignoring its limitations which other thinkers have pointed out. Such people are apt to reason that because the human intellect, in its present state of development, reports that such a thing must be or cannot possibly be, that the matter is forever settled. They ignore the fact that it is possible that man's intellect in its present state of unfoldment may be able to take cognizance of only a very small part of the universal fact and that there may be regions upon regions of reality and fact of which he cannot even dream 
so far are they removed from his experience. The unfoldment of a new sense would open out a new world and might bring to light facts that would completely revolutionize our entire world of conceptions by reason of the new information it would give us. But nevertheless, from this mental consciousness has come the wonderful work of intellect, as shown in the achievements of man up to this time. And while we must recognize its limitations, we gladly join in singing its praises. Reason is the tool with which man is digging into the mine of facts, bringing to light new treasures every day. This stage of mental consciousness is bringing to man knowledge of himself, knowledge of the universe, that is well worth the price he pays for it. For man does pay a price for entrance into this stage, and he pays an increasing price as he advances in its territory, for the higher he advances, the more keenly he feels and suffers, as well as enjoys. Capacity for pain is the price man pays for attainment, up to a certain stage. His pain passes from the physical to the mental consciousness, and he becomes aware of problems that he never dreamt existed, and the lack of an intelligent answer produces mental suffering. And the mental suffering that comes to him from unsatisfied longings, disappointment, the pain of others whom he loves, etc., is far worse than any physical suffering. The animal lives its animal life and is contented for it knows no better. If it had enough to eat, a place to sleep, a mate, it is happy. And some men are likewise. But others find themselves involved in a world of mental discomfort. New wants arise, and the lack of satisfaction brings pain. Civilization becomes more and more complex, and brings its new pains as well as new pleasures. Man attaches himself to things, and each day creates for himself artificial wants, which he must labor to meet. His intellect may not lead him upward, but instead may merely enable him to invent new and subtle means and ways of gratifying his senses to a degree impossible to the animals. Some men make a religion of the gratification of their sensuality, their appetites, and become beasts magnified by the power of intellect. Others become vain, conceited, and puffed up, with a sense of importance of their personality, the false eye. Others become morbidly introspective and spend their time analyzing and dissecting their moods, motives, feelings, etc. Others exhaust their capacity for pleasure and happiness, but looking outside for it instead of within, and become blasé, bored, ennuied, and an affliction to themselves. We mention these things not in a spirit of pessimism, but merely to show that even this great mental consciousness has a reverse and ugly side, as well as the bright face that has been ascribed to it. As man reaches the higher stages of this mental consciousness, and the next higher stage begins to dawn upon him, he is apt to feel more keenly than ever the insufficiency of life as it appears to him. He is unable to understand himself his origin, destiny, purpose, and nature, and he chafes against the bars of the cage of intellect in which he is confined. He asks himself the question, Whence come I? Whither go I? What is the object of my existence? He becomes dissatisfied with the answers the world has to give him to these questions, and he cries aloud in despair. And but the answer of his own voice comes back to him from the impassable walls with which he is surrounded. He does not realize that his answer must come from within, but so it is. Psychology stops when it reaches the limits of mental consciousness, or, as it calls it, self-consciousness, and denies that there is anything beyond, any unexplored regions of the mind. It laughs at the reports that come from those who have penetrated farther within the recesses of their being, and dismisses the reports as mere dreams, fantasies, illusions, ecstatic imagings, abnormal states, etc., etc. But nevertheless, there are schools of thought that teach of these higher states, 
and there are men of all ages and races that have entered them and have reported concerning them. And we feel justified in asking you to take them into consideration. There are two planes of consciousness of which we feel it proper to speak, for we have obtained more or less information regarding them. There are still higher planes, but they belong to higher phases of life than we are dealt with here. The first of these planes or states of consciousness, above the self-consciousness of the psychologists, which we have called mental consciousness, may be called ego consciousness, for it brings an awareness of the reality of the ego. This awareness is far above the self-consciousness of the man who is able to distinguish I from you and to give it a name, and far above the consciousness that enables a man, as he rises in the scale, to distinguish the I from faculty after faculty of the mind, which he is able to recognize as not I, until he finds left a mental something that he cannot set aside, which he calls I, although this stage alone is very much higher than that of the average of the race and is a high degree of attainment itself. It is akin to this last stage, and yet still fuller and more complete. In the dawning of ego consciousness, the I recognizes itself still more clearly and, more than this, is fully imbued with a sense and awareness of its own reality, unknown to it before. This awareness is not a mere matter of reasoning. It is a consciousness, just as is physical consciousness and mental consciousness something different from an intellectual conviction. It is a knowing, not a thinking or believing. The I knows that it is real, that it has its roots in the supreme reality underlying all the universe and partakes of its essence. It does not know what this reality is, but it knows that it is real and something different from anything in the world of name, form, number, time, space, cause and effect, something transcendental and surpassing all human experience. And knowing this, it knows that it cannot be destroyed or hurt, cannot die, but is immortal, and that there is something which is the very essence of good, behind of, underneath, and even in itself. And in this certainty and consciousness is their peace, understanding, and power. When it fully bursts upon one, doubt, fear, unrest, and dissatisfaction drop from him like worn-out garments, and he finds himself clothed in the faith that knows, fearlessness, restfulness, satisfaction. Then he is able to say understandingly and with meaning, I am. This ego consciousness is coming to many as a dawning knowledge. The light is just rising from behind the hills. To others, it has come gradually and slowly, but fully, and they now live in the full light of the consciousness. Others, it has burst upon like a flash or vision, like a light falling from the clear sky, almost blinding them at first, but leaving them changed men and women, possessed of that something that cannot be understood by or described to those who have not experienced it. This last stage is called illumination in one of its forms. The man of the ego consciousness may not understand the riddle of the universe or be able to give an answer to the great questions of life, but he has ceased to worry about them. They now disturb him not. He may use his intellect upon them as before, but never with the feeling that in their intellectual solution rests his happiness or peace of mind. He knows that he stands on solid rock, and though the storms of the world of matter and force may beat upon him, he will not be hurt. This and other things he knows. He cannot prove these things to others, for they are not demonstrable by argument. He himself did not get them in that way, and so he says but little about it, but lives his life as if he knew them not, so far as outward appearances go. But inwardly he is a changed man. His life is different from that of his brothers, 
for while their souls are wrapped in slumber or tossing in troubled dreams, his soul has awakened and is gazing upon the world with bright and fearless eyes. There are, of course, different stages or degrees of this consciousness, just as there are in the lower planes of consciousness. Some have it to a slight degree, while others have it fully. Perhaps this lesson will teach some of its readers just what is the thing that has happened to them, and which they hesitate to speak of to their closest friend or life companion. To others it may open the way to a fuller realization. We sincerely trust so, for one does not begin to live until he knows the I as reality. There is a stage still higher than this last mentioned, but it has come to but very few of the race. Reports of it come from all times, races, countries. It has been called cosmic consciousness, and is described as an awareness of the oneness of life, that is, a consciousness that the universe is filled with one life, an actual perception and awareness that the universe is full of life, motion, and mind, and that there is no such thing as blind force or dead matter, but that all is alive, vibrating, and intelligent. That is, of course, that the real universe, which is the essence or background of the universe of matter, energy, and mind, is as they describe. In fact, the description of those who have had glimpses of this state would indicate that they see the universe as all mind, that all is mind at the last. This form of consciousness has been experienced by men here and there, only a few, in moments of illumination, the period lasting but a very short space of time, then fading away, leaving but a memory. In the moment of the illumination, there came to those experiencing it a sense of in-touchness with universal knowledge and life, impossible to describe, accompanied by a joy beyond understanding. Regarding this last, cosmic consciousness, we would state that it means more than an intellectual conviction, belief, or realization of the facts as stated, for an actual vision and consciousness of these things came in the moment of illumination. Some others report that they have a deep abiding sense of the reality of the facts described by the report of the illumined, but they have not experienced the vision or ecstasy referred to. These last people seem to have with them always the same mental state as that possessed by those who had the vision and passed out of it, carrying with them the remembrance and feeling, but not the actual consciousness attained at the moment. They agree upon the essential particulars of the reports. Dr. Maurice Buck, now passed out of this plane of life, wrote a book entitled Cosmic Consciousness, in which he describes a number of these cases, including his own, Walt Whitman's, and others, and in which he holds that this stage of consciousness is before the race and will gradually come to it in the future. He holds that the manifestation of it, which has come to some few of the race, as above stated, is but the first beams of the sun which are flashing upon us and which are but prophecies of the appearance of the great body of light itself. We shall not here consider at length the reports of certain great religious personages of the past who have left records that in moments of great spiritual exaltation they became conscious of a being in the presence of the Absolute, or perhaps within the radius of the light of its countenance. We have great respect for these reports and have every reason for believing many of them authentic notwithstanding the conflicting reports that have been handed down to us by those experiencing them. These reports are conflicting because of the fact that the minds of those who had these glimpses of consciousness were not prepared or trained to fully understand the nature of the phenomena. They found themselves in the spiritual presence of something of awful grandeur and spiritual rank, and they were completely dazed and bewildered at the sight. They did not understand the nature of the Absolute, 
and when they had sufficiently recovered, they reported that they had been in the presence of God, the word God meaning their particular conception of deity, that is, the one appearing as deity in their own particular religious creed or school. They saw nothing to cause them to identify this something with their particular conception of deity, except that they thought that it must be God, and knowing no other God except their own particular conception, they naturally identifying the something with God as they conceived him to be. And their reports naturally were along these lines. Thus the reports of all religions are filled with accounts of the so-called miraculous occurrences. The Catholic saint reports that he saw the light of God's countenance, and the non-Catholic reports likewise regarding God as he knows him. The Mohammedan reports that he caught a glimpse of the face of Allah, and the Buddhist tells us that he saw Buddha under the tree. The Brahmin has seen the face of Brahma, and the various Hindu sects have men who give similar reports regarding their own particular deities. The Persians have given similar reports, and even the ancient Egyptians have left records of similar occurrences. These conflicting reports have led to the belief on the part of those who did not understand the nature of the phenomena, that these things were all imagination and fancy, if indeed not rank falsehood and imposture. But the yogis know better than this. They know that underneath all these varying reports is a common ground of truth, which will be apparent to anyone investigating the matter. They know that all of these reports except a few based upon fraudulent imitation of the real phenomenon, are based upon truth and are but the bewildered reports of various observers. They know that these people were temporarily lifted above the ordinary plane of consciousness and were made aware of the existence of a being or beings higher than mortal. It does not follow that they saw God or the Absolute, for there are many beings of high spiritual growth, and the development would appear to the ordinary mortal as a very god. The Catholic doctrine of angels and archangels is corroborated by those among the yogis who have been behind the veil, and they give us reports of the divas and other advanced beings. So the yogi accepts these reports of the various mystics, saints, and inspired ones, and accounts for them all by laws perfectly natural to the students of the yogi philosophy but which appear as supernatural to those who have not studied along these lines. But we cannot speak further of this phase of the subject in this lesson, for a full discussion of it would lead us far away from the phase of the general subject before us. But we wish to be understood as saying that there are certain centers in the mental being of man from which may come light regarding the existence of the absolute and higher order of beings. In fact, from these centers come to man that part of his mental feelings that he calls the religious instinct or intuition. Man does not arrive at that underlying consciousness of something beyond by means of his intellect. It is the glimmer of light coming from the high centers of the self. He notices these gleams of light, but not understanding them, he proceeds to erect elaborate theological and creedal structures to account for them, the work of the intellect, however, always lacking that feeling that the intuition itself possesses. True religion, no matter under what name it may masquerade, comes from the heart, and is not comforted or satisfied with these intellectual explanations, and hence comes that unrest and craving for satisfaction which comes to man when the light begins to break through. But we must postpone a further discussion of this part of the subject for the present. We shall consider it again in a future lesson in connection with other matters. As we have said, our next two lessons will take upon the inquiry regarding the regions outside of the consciousness of the ordinary man. You will find it a most fascinating and instructive inquiry, and one that will open up new fields of thought for many of you. Mantram Affirmation. I am a being far greater and grander than I have as yet conceived. I am unfolding gradually but surely into higher planes of consciousness. 
I am moving forward and upward constantly. My goal is the realization of the true self, and I welcome each stage of unfoldment that leads me toward my aim. I am a manifestation of reality. I am. End of Section 17 Section 18 The Eighth Lesson The Highlands and Lowlands of Mind Part 1 A Series of Lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramacharaka Section 18 The Eighth Lesson The Highlands and Lowlands of Mind the self of each of us has a vehicle of expression which we call the mind, but which vehicle is much larger and far more complex than we are apt to realize. As a writer has said, our self is greater than we know. It has peaks above and lowlands below the plateau of our conscious experience. That which we know as the conscious mind is not the soul. The soul is not a part of that which we know in consciousness, but on the contrary, that which we know in consciousness is but a small part of the soul, the conscious vehicle of a greater self, or I. Yogis have always taught that the mind has many planes of manifestation and action, and that many of its planes operated above and below the plane of consciousness. Western science is beginning to realize this fact, and its theories regarding same may be found in any of the latter works on psychology. But this is a matter of recent development in Western science. Until very recently, the textbooks held that consciousness and mind were synonymous, and that the mind was conscious of all of its activities, changes, and modifications. Leibniz was one of the first Western philosophers to advance the idea that there were planes of mental activity outside of the plane of consciousness. And since his time, the leading thinkers have slowly but surely moved forward to his position. At the present time, it is generally conceded that at least 90% of our mental operations take place in the out-of-conscious realm. Professor Elmer Gates, the well-known scientist, has said, at least 90% of our mental life is subconscious. If you will analyze your mental operations, you will find that conscious thinking is never a continuous line of consciousness, but a series of conscious data with great intervals of subconscious. We sit and try to solve a problem and fail. We walk around, try again, and fail. Suddenly, an idea dawns that leads to the solution of the problem. The subconscious processes were at work. We do not volitionally create our own thinking. It takes place in us. We are more or less passive recipients. We cannot change the nature of a thought or of a truth, but we can, as it were, guide the ship by a moving of the helm. Our mentation is largely the result of the great cosmic whole upon us. Sir William Hamilton says, that the sphere of our consciousness is only a small circle in the center of a far wider sphere of action and thought, of which we are conscious through its effects. Taine says, outside of a little luminous circle lies a large ring of twilight, and beyond this an indefinite night. But the events of this twilight and this night are as real as those within the luminous circle. Sir Oliver Lodge, the eminent English scientist, speaking of the planes of the mind, says, Imagine an iceberg glorying in its crisp solidity and sparkling pinnacles, resenting attention paid to its submerged self, or supporting region, or to the saline liquid out of which it arose, and into which, in due course, it will some day return. Or, reversing the metaphor, we might liken our present state to that of the hulls of ships submerged in a dim ocean among strange monsters, propelled in a blind manner through space, proud perhaps of accumulating many barnacles as decoration, only recognizing our destination by bumping against the dock wall, and with no cognizance of the deck and cabins above us, or the spars and sails, no thought of the sexton and the compass and the captain 
no perception of the lookout on the mast, of the distant horizon. With no vision of objects far ahead, dangers to be avoided, destinations to be reached, other ships to be spoken to by means other than by bodily contact, a region of sunshine and cloud, of space or perception, and of intelligence utterly inaccessible to parts below the water line. We ask our students to read carefully the above expression of Sir Oliver Lodge, for it gives one of the clearest and most accurate figures of the actual state of affairs concerning the mental planes that we have seen in Western writings. And other Western writers have noted and spoken of these out-of-conscious realms. Lewis has said, It is very certain that in every conscious volition, every act that is so characterized, the larger part of it is quite unconscious. It is equally certain that in every perception there are unconscious processes of reproduction and inference. There is a middle distance of subconsciousness and a background of unconsciousness. Taine has told us that mental events imperceptible to consciousness are far more numerous than the others, and of the world that makes up our being we only perceive the highest points, the lighted up peaks of a continent whose lower levels remain in the shade. Beneath ordinary sensations are their components, that is to say, the elementary sensations, which must be combined into groups to reach our consciousness. Maudsley says, examine closely and without bias the ordinary mental operations of daily life, and you will find that consciousness has not one-tenth part of the function therein which it is commonly assumed to have. In every conscious state there are at work conscious, subconscious, and infraconscious energies, the last as indispensable as the first. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, There are thoughts that never emerge into consciousness, which yet make their influence felt among the perceptible mental currents, just as the unseen planets sway the movements of those that are watched and mapped by the astronomer. Many other writers have given us examples and instances of the operation of the out-of-consciousness planes of thought. One has written that when the solution of a problem he had long vainly dealt with flashed across his mind, he trembled as if in the presence of another being who had communicated a secret to him. All of us have tried to remember a name or similar thing without success and have then dismissed the matter from our minds, only to have the missing name or thought suddenly presented to our conscious mind a few minutes or hours afterwards. Something in our mind was at work hunting up the missing word, and when it found it, it presented it to us. A writer has mentioned what he called unconscious rumination, which happened to him when he read books presenting new points of view essentially opposed to his previous opinions. After days, weeks, or months, he found, to his great astonishment, the old opinions were entirely rearranged, and the new ones lodged there. Many examples of this unconscious mental digestion and assimilation are mentioned in the books on the subject written during the past few years. It is related of Sir W. R. Hamilton that he discovered quaternions one day while walking with his wife in the observatory at Dublin. He relates that he suddenly felt the galvanic circle of thought close, and the sparks that fell from it was the fundamental mathematical relations of his problem, which is now an important law in mathematics. Dr. Thompson has written, at times I have had a feeling of the uselessness of all voluntary effort, and also that the matter was working itself clear in my mind. It has many times seemed to me that I was really a passive instrument in the hands of a person not myself. In view of having to wait for the results of these unconscious processes, I have proved the habit of getting together material in advance, and then leaving the mass to digest itself till I am ready to write about it. I delayed for a month the writing of my book, Systems of Psychology, but continued reading the authorities. 
I would not try to think about the book. I would watch with interest the people passing the windows. One evening, when reading the paper, the substance of the missing part of the book flashed upon my mind, and I began to write. This is only a sample of many such experiences. Bertolotte, the founder of synthetic chemistry, has said that the experiments leading to his wonderful discoveries have never been the result of carefully followed trains of thought, of pure reasoning processes, but have come to themselves, so to speak, from the clear sky. Mozart has written, I cannot really say that I can account for my compositions. My ideas flow, and I cannot say whence or how they come. I do not hear in my imagination the parts successively, but I hear them, as it were, all at once. The rest is merely an attempt to reproduce what I have heard. Dr. Thompson, above mentioned, has also said, In writing this work, I have been unable to arrange my knowledge of a subject for days and weeks until I experienced a clearing up of my mind when I took my pen and unhesitatingly wrote the result. I have best accomplished this by leading the conscious mind as far away as possible from the subject upon which I was writing. Professor Barrett says, The mysteriousness of our being is not confined to subtle psychological processes which we have in common with all animal life. There are higher and more capacious powers wrapped up in our human personality than are expressed even by what we know of consciousness, will, or reason. There are supernormal and transcendental powers of which at present we only catch occasional glimpses, and behind and beyond the supernormal there are fathomless abysses, the divine ground of the soul, the ultimate reality of which our consciousness is but the reflection or faint perception. Into such lofty themes I do not propose to enter. They must be forever beyond the scope of human inquiry. Nor is it possible within the limits of this paper to give any adequate conception of those mysterious regions of our complex personality, which are open to and beginning to be disclosed by scientific investigation. Rev. Dr. Andrew Murray has written, Deeper down than where the soul with its consciousness can enter, there is spirit matter linking man with God. And deeper down than the mind and feelings or will, in the unseen depths of the hidden life, there dwells the spirit of God. This testimony is remarkable, coming from that source, for it corroborates and reiterates the yogi teachings of the indwelling spirit Schofield has written. Our conscious mind, as compared with the unconscious mind, has been likened to the visible spectrum of the sun's rays, as compared to the invisible part which stretches indefinitely on either side. We know now that the chief part of heat comes from the ultra-red rays that show no light, and the main part of the chemical changes in the vegetable world are the results of the ultraviolet rays at the other end of the spectrum which are equally invisible to the eye, and are recognized only by their potent effects. Indeed, as these invisible rays extend indefinitely on both sides of the visible spectrum, so we may say that the mind includes not only the visible or conscious part, and what we have termed the subconscious, that which lies below the red line, but the superconscious mind that lies at the other end, all those regions of higher soul and spirit life, of which we are only at times vaguely conscious, but which always exist and link us on to eternal verities on the one side, as surely as the subconscious mind links us to the body on the other. We know that our students will appreciate the above testimony of Dr. Schofield, for it is directly in the line of our teachings in the yogi philosophy regarding the planes of the mind. See 14 Lessons. We feel justified in quoting further from Dr. Schofield, for he voices in the strongest manner that which the yogi philosophy teaches as fundamental truths regarding the mind. Dr. Schofield is an English writer on psychology, and so far as we know has no tendency toward occultism. 
his views having been arrived at by careful scientific study and investigation along the lines of Western psychology, which renders his testimony all the more valuable, showing as it does how the human mind will instinctively find its way to the truth, even if it has to blaze a new trail through the woods, departing from the beaten tracks of other minds around it, which lack the courage or enterprise to strike out for themselves. Dr. Schofield writes, The mind, indeed, reaches all the way, and while on the one hand it is inspired by the Almighty, on the other it energizes the body, all whose purposive life it originates. We may call the superconscious mind the sphere of the spirit life, the subconscious the sphere of the body life, and the conscious mind the middle region where both meet. Continuing, Dr. Schofield says, The Spirit of God is said to dwell in believers, and yet, as we have seen, His presence is not the subject of direct consciousness. We would include, therefore, in the superconscious all such spiritual ideas, together with conscious, the voice of God, as Max Muller calls it, which is surely a half-conscious faculty. Moreover, the superconscious, like the subconscious, is, as we have said, best apprehended when the conscious mind is not active. Visions, meditations, prayers, and even dreams have been undoubtedly occasions of spiritual revelations, and many instances may be adduced as illustrations of the workings of the spirit apart from the action of reason or mind. The truth apparently is that the mind as a whole is an unconscious state, by that its middle registers, excluding the highest spiritual and lowest physical manifestations, are fitfully illuminated in varying degree by consciousness, and that it is to this illuminated part of the dial that the word mind, which rightly appertains to the whole, has been limited. Oliver Wendell Holmes has said, the automatic flow of thought is often singularly favored by the fact of listening to a weak, continuous discourse, with just enough ideas in it to keep the conscious mind busy. The induced current of thought is often rapid and brilliant in inverse ratio to the force of the inducing current. Wundt says, the unconscious logical processes are carried on with a certainty and regularity which would be impossible where there exists the possibility of error. Our mind is so happily designed that it prepares for us the most important foundations of cognition, whilst we have not the slightest apprehension of the modus operandi. This unconscious soul, like a benevolent stranger, works and makes provisions for our benefit pouring only the mature fruits into our laps. A writer in an English magazine interestingly writes, Intimations reach our consciousness from unconsciousness, that the mind is ready to work, is fresh, is full of ideas. The grounds of our judgment are often knowledge so remote from consciousness that we cannot bring them to view. That the human mind includes an unconscious part that unconscious events occurring in that part are proximate causes of consciousness, that the greater part of human intuitional action is an effect of an unconscious cause? The truth of these propositions is so deducible from ordinary mental events, and is so near the surface, that the failure of deduction to forestall induction in the discerning of it may well excite wonder. Our behavior is influenced by unconscious assumptions respecting our own social and intellectual rank and that of the one we are addressing. In company we unconsciously assume a bearing quite different from that of the home circle. After being raised to a higher rank, the whole behavior subtly and unconsciously changes in accordance with it. And Schofield adds to the last sentence, This is also the case in a minor degree with different styles and qualities of dress and different environments. Quite unconsciously, we change our behavior, carriage, and style to suit the circumstance. Jensen writes, When we reflect on anything with the whole force of the mind, we may fall into a state of entire unconsciousness, in which we not only forget the outer world, but also know nothing at all of ourselves 
and the thoughts passing within us after a time. We then suddenly awake as from a dream, and usually at the same moment the result of our meditations appears as distinctly in consciousness without our knowing how we reached it. Bascom says, It is inexplicable how premises which lie below consciousness can sustain conclusions in consciousness, how the mind can wittingly take up a mental movement at an advanced stage, having missed its primary steps. Hamilton and other writers have compared the mind's action to that of a row of billiard balls, of which one is struck and the impetus transmitted throughout the entire row, the result being that only the last ball actually moves, the others remaining in their places. The last ball represents the conscious thought, the other stages in the unconscious mentation. Lewis, speaking of this illustration, says, Something like this, Hamilton says, seems often to occur in a train of thought, one idea immediately suggesting another into consciousness. This suggestion, passing through one or more ideas which do not themselves rise into consciousness. This point, that we are not conscious of the formation of groups, but only of a formed group, may throw light on the existence of unconscious judgments, unconscious reasonings, and unconscious registrations of experience. End of section 18. Section 19 of a series of lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramacharaka. Section 19. The Eighth Lesson The Highlands and Lowlands of Mind. Part 2. Many writers have related the process by which the unconscious mentation emerges gradually into the field of consciousness and the discomfort attending the process. A few examples may prove interesting and instructive. Maudsley says, It is surprising how uncomfortable a person may be made by the obscure idea of something which he ought to have said or done, and which he cannot for the life of him remember. There is an effort of the lost idea to get into consciousness, which is relieved directly the idea bursts into consciousness. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, There are thoughts that never emerge into consciousness, and which yet make their influence felt among the perceptive mental currents, just as the unseen planets sway the movements of the known ones. The same writer also remarks, I was told of a businessman in Boston who had given up thinking of an important question as too much for him but he continued so uneasy in his brain that he feared he was threatened with palsy. After some hours, the natural solution of the question came to him, worked out, as he believed, in that troubled interval. Dr. Schofield mentions several instances of this phase of the workings of the unconscious planes of the mind. We mention a couple that seem interesting and to the point. Last year, says Dr. Schofield, I was driving to Fillmore Gardens to give some letters to a friend. On the way, a vague uneasiness sprang up, and a voice seemed to say, I doubt if you have those letters. Conscious reason rebuked it and said, Of course you have. You took them out of the drawer specially. The vague feeling was not satisfied, but could not reply. On arrival, I found the letters were in none of my pockets. On returning, I found them on the hall table, where they had been placed a moment, putting on my gloves. The other day, I had to go see a patient in Folkestone, in Shakespeare Terrace. I got there very late, and did not stay, but drove down to the pavilion for the night, it being dark and rainy. Next morning, at eleven, I walked up to find the house, knowing the general direction, though never having walked there before. I went up the main road, and after passing a certain turning, began to feel a vague uneasiness coming into consciousness that I had passed the terrace. On asking the way, I found it was so, and the turning was where the uneasiness began. The night before was pitch dark and very wet, and anything seen from a close carriage was quite unconsciously impressed on my mind. Professor Kirshner says, our consciousness can only grasp one quite clear idea at once. 
all other ideas are for the time somewhat obscure. They are really existing, but only potentially for consciousness, i.e., they hover, as it were, on our horizon or beneath the threshold of consciousness. The fact that former ideas suddenly return to consciousness is simply explained by the fact that they have continued psychic existence, and attention is sometimes voluntarily or involuntarily turned away from the present, and the appearance of former ideas is thus made possible. Oliver Wendell Holmes says, Our different ideas are stepping stones. How we get from one to another we do not know. Something carries us. We, our conscious selves, do not take the step. The creating and informing spirit, which is within us and not of us, is recognized everywhere in real life. It comes to us as a voice that will be heard. It tells us what we must believe. It frames our sentences, and we wonder at this visitor who chooses our brain as his dwelling place. Galton says, I have desired to show how whole states of mental operation that have lapsed out of ordinary consciousness admit of being dragged into light. Montgomery says, We are constantly aware that feelings emerge unsolicited by any previous mental state, directly from the dark womb of unconsciousness. Indeed, all our most vivid feelings are thus mystically derived. Suddenly, a new, irrelevant, unwilled, unlooked-for presence intrudes itself into consciousness. Some inscrutable power causes it to rise and enter the mental presence as a sensorial constituent. If this vivid dependence on unconscious forces has to be conjectured with regard to the most vivid mental occurrences, how much more must such a sustaining foundation be postulated for those faint revivals of previous sensations that so largely assist in making up our complex mental presence? Sir Benjamin Brodie says, It has often happened to me to have accumulated a store of facts but to have been able to proceed no further. Then, after an interval of time, I have found the obscurity and confusion to have cleared away, the facts to have settled in their right places, though I have not been sensible of having made any effort for that purpose. Wundt says, The traditional opinion that consciousness is the entire field of the internal life cannot be accepted. In consciousness, Psychic acts are very distinct from one another, and observation itself necessarily conducts to the unity in psychology. But the agent of this unity is outside of consciousness, which knows only the result of the work done in the unknown laboratory beneath it. Suddenly a new thought springs into being. Ultimate analysis of psychic processes shows that the unconscious is the theater of the most important mental phenomena. The conscious is always conditional upon the unconscious. Crichton says, Our conscious life is the sum of these entrances and exits. Behind the scenes, as we infer, there lies a vast reserve which we call the unconscious, finding a name for it by the simple device of prefixing the negative article. The basis of all that lies behind the scene is the mere negative of consciousness. Maudsley says, The process of reasoning adds nothing to knowledge in the reasoner. It only displays what was there before and brings to conscious possession what before was unconscious. And again, Mind can do its work without knowing it. Consciousness is the light that lightens the process not the agent that accomplishes it. Wallstein says, It is through the subconscious self that Shakespeare must have perceived, without effort, great truths which are hidden from the conscious mind of the student. That Phidias painted marble and bronze, that Raphael painted Madonnas, and Beethoven composed symphonies. Ribot says, The mind receives from experience certain data, and elaborates them unconsciously by laws peculiar to itself, and the result merges into consciousness. Newman says, 
when the unaccustomed causes surprise we do not perceive the thing and then feel the surprise but surprise comes first and then we search out the cause so the theory must have acted on the unconscious mind to create the feeling before being perceived in consciousness a writer in an english magazine says of what transcendent importance is the fact that the unconscious part of the mind bears to the conscious part such a relation as the magic lantern bears to the luminous disk which it projects that the greater part of the intentional action the whole practical life of the vast majority of men is an effect of events as remote from consciousness as the motion of the planets dr schofield says it is quite true that the range of the unconscious mind must necessarily remain indefinite none can say how high or low it may reach as to how far the unconscious powers of life that as has been said can make eggs and feathers out of indian corn and milk and beef and mutton out of grass are to be considered within or beyond the lowest limits of unconscious mind we do not therefore here press it is enough to establish the fact of its existence to point out its more important features and to show that in all respects it is as worthy of being called mind as that which works in consciousness we therefore return to our first definition of mind as the sum of psychic action in us whether conscious or unconscious hartmann calls our attention to a very important fact when he says the unconscious does not fall ill the unconscious does not grow weary but all conscious mental activity becomes fatigued kant says to have ideas and yet not be conscious of them therein seems to lie a contradiction however we may still be immediately aware of holding an idea though we are not directly conscious of it maudsley says it may seem paradoxical to assert not merely that ideas may exist in the mind without any consciousness of them but that an idea or a train of associated ideas may be quickened into action and actuate moments without itself being attended to when an idea disappears from consciousness it does not necessarily disappear entirely it may remain latent below the horizon of consciousness moreover it may produce an effect upon movement or upon other ideas when thus active below the horizon of consciousness leibniz says it does not follow that because we do not perceive thought that it does not exist it is a great source of error to believe that there is no perception in the mind but that of which it is conscious oliver wendell holmes says the more we examine the mechanism of thought the more we shall see that anterior unconscious action of the mind that enters largely into all of its processes people who talk most do not always think most i question whether persons who think most that is who have most conscious thought pass through their mind necessarily do most mental work every new idea planted in a real thinker's mind grows when he is least conscious of it maudsley says it would go hard with mankind indeed if they must act wittingly before they acted at all men without knowing why follow a course for which good reasons exist nay more the practical instincts of mankind often work beneficially in actual contradiction to their professed doctrines the same writer says the best thoughts of an author are the unwilled thoughts which surprise himself and the poet under the influence of creative activity is so far as consciousness is concerned being dictated to a writer in an english magazine says when waiting on a pier for a steamer i went on to the first which was the wrong one i came back and waited losing my boat which was at another part of the pier on account of the unconscious assumption i had made 
that this was the only place to wait for the steamer. I saw a man enter a room and leave by another door. Shortly after, I saw another man exactly like him do the same. It was the same man, but I said it must be his twin brother, in the unconscious assumption that there was no exit for the first man, but by the way he came, that by returning. Maudsley says, the firmest resolve or purpose sometimes vanishes issueless when it comes to the brink of an act, while the true will, which determines perhaps a different act, springs up suddenly out of the depths of the unconscious nature, surprising and overcoming the conscious. Schofield says, our unconscious influence is the projection of our own unconscious mind and personality unconsciously over others. This acts unconsciously on their unconscious centers, producing effects in character and conduct recognized in consciousness. For instance, the entrance of a good man into a room where foul language is used will unconsciously modify and purify the tone of the whole room. Our minds cast shadows of which we are as unconscious as those cast by our bodies, but which affect for good or evil all who unconsciously pass within their range. This is a matter of daily experience, and is common to all, though more noticeable with strong personalities. Now we have given much time and space to the expressions of opinion of various Western writers regarding this subject of there being a plane or planes of the mind outside of the field of consciousness. We have given space to this valuable testimony, not alone because of its intrinsic value and merit, but because we wished to impress upon the minds of our students that these out-of-conscious planes of mind are now being recognized by the best authorities in the Western world, although it has been only a few years back when the idea was laughed at as ridiculous and as a mere dream of the Oriental teachers. Each writer quoted has brought out some interesting and valuable point of the subject, and the student will find that his own experiences corroborate the points cited by the several writers. In this way, we think the matter will be made plainer and will become fixed in the minds of those who are studying this course of lessons. But we must caution our students from hastily adopting the theories of Western writers advanced during the past few years regarding these out-of-conscious states. The trouble has been that the Western writers, dazzled by the view of the subconscious planes of mentation that suddenly burst upon the Western thought, hastily adopted certain theories which they felt would account for all the phenomena known as psychic, and which they thought would fully account for all the problems of the subject. These writers, while doing a most valuable work, which has helped thousands to form new ideas regarding the nature and workings of the mind, nevertheless did not sufficiently explore the nature of the problem before them. A little study of the Oriental philosophies might have saved them and their readers much confusion. For instance, the majority of these writers hastily assumed that because there was an out-of-conscious plane of mentation, therefore all the workings of the mind might be grouped under the head of conscious and subconscious, and that all the out-of-conscious phenomena might be grouped under the head of subconscious mind, subjective mind, etc., ignoring the fact that this class of mental phenomena embraced not only the highest but the lowest forms of mentation. In their newly found mind, which they called subjective, or subconscious, they placed the lowest traits and animal passions, insane impulses, delusions, bigotry, animal-like intelligence, etc., etc., as well as the inspiration of the poet and musician, and the high spiritual longings and feelings that one recognizes as having come from the higher regions of the soul. This mistake was a natural one, and at first reading the Western world was taken by storm and accepted the new ideas and theories as truth. 
but when reflection came and analysis was applied, there arose a feeling of disappointment and dissatisfaction, and people began to feel that there was something lacking. They intuitively recognized that their higher inspirations and intuitions came from a different part of the mind than the lower emotions, passions, and other subconscious feelings and instincts. A glance at the Oriental philosophies will give one the key to the problem at once. The Oriental teachers have always held that the conscious mentation was but a small fraction of the entire volume of thought, but they have always taught that just as there was a field of mentation below consciousness, so was there a field of mentation above consciousness as much higher than intellect as the other was lower than it. The mere mention of this fact will prove a revelation to those who have not heard it before and who have become entangled with the several dual mind theories of the recent Western writers. The more one has read on this subject, the more he will appreciate the superiority of the Oriental theory over that of the Western writers. It is like the chemical which at once clears the clouded liquid in the test tube. In our next lesson, we shall go into this subject of the above conscious planes and the below conscious planes, bringing out the distinction clearly and adding to what we have said on the subject in previous books. And all this is leading us toward the point where we may give you instruction regarding the training and cultivation, the retraining and guidance of those out-of-conscious facilities. By retraining the lower planes of mentation to their proper work, and by stimulating the higher ones, man may make himself over, mentally, and may acquire powers of which he but dreams now. This is why we are leading you up to the understanding of this subject step by step. We advise you to acquaint yourself with each phase of the matter, that you may be able to apply the teachings and instructions to follow in later lessons of the course. Matram Affirmation I recognize that my self is greater than it seems, that above and below consciousness are planes of mind, that just as there are lower planes of mind which belong to my past experience in ages past and over which I must now assert my mastery, so are there planes of mind into which I am unfolding gradually, which will bring me wisdom, power, and joy. I am myself in the midst of this mental world. I am the master of my mind. I assert my control of its lower phases, and I demand of its higher all that it has in store for me. End of section 19 Section 20 of a series of lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramacharaka The Ninth Lesson, The Mental Planes, Part 1 in our last lesson, we told you something about the operation of the mind outside of the field of consciousness. In this lesson, we will attempt to classify these out-of-consciousness planes by directing your attention to the several mental planes above and below the plane of consciousness. As we stated in the last lesson, over 90% of our mental operations are conducted outside of the field of consciousness so that the consideration of the planes is seen to be an important subject. Man is a center of consciousness in the great one life of the universe. His soul has climbed a great many steps before it reached its present position and stage of unfoldment. And it will pass through many more steps until it is entirely free and delivered from the necessity of its swaddling clothes. In his mental being, man contains traces of all that has gone before, all the experiences of himself and the great race movement of which he is a part. And, likewise, his mind contains faculties and mental planes which have not as yet unfolded into consciousness, and of the existence of which he is but imperfectly aware. All of these mental possessions, however, are useful and valuable to him, even the lowest. The lowest may be used to advantage, 
under proper mastery, and are only dangerous to the man who allows them to master him instead of serving him as they should, considering his present stage of development. In this consideration of the several mental planes, we shall not confine ourselves to the technical occult terms given to these several planes, but will place them in general groups and describe the features and characteristics of each, rather than branch off into long explanations of the growth and reason of the several planes, which would take us far away from the practical consideration of the subject. Beginning at the lowest point of the scale, we see that man has a body. The body is composed of minute cells of protoplasm. These cells are built up of countless molecules, atoms, and particles of matter, precisely the same matter that composes the rocks, trees, air, etc. around him. The yogi philosophy tells us that even the atoms of matter have life and an elementary manifestation of mind, which causes them to group together according to the law of attraction, forming different elements, combinations, etc. This law of attraction is a mental operation and is the first evidence of mental choice, action, and response. Below this is prana, or force, which, strictly speaking, is also a manifestation of mind, although for convenience we designate it as a separate manifestation of the Absolute. And therefore, we find that this law of attraction between the atoms and particles of matter is a mental action, and that it belongs to man's mental kingdom, because he has a body and this mental action is continually going on in his body. So therefore, this is the lowest mental plane to be considered in the makeup of the man. This plane is, of course, far sunken beneath the plane of consciousness and is scarcely identified with the personality of the man at all, but rather belongs to the life of the whole, manifest in the rock as well as in the man. But after these atoms have been grouped by the law of attraction and have formed molecules of matter, they are taken possession of by a higher mental activity and built up into cells by the mental action of the plant. The life impulse of the plant begins by drawing to it certain particles of inorganic matter, chemical elements, and then building them into a single cell. Oh, mystery of the cell! The intellect of man is unable to duplicate this wonderful process. The mind principle on the vegetative plane, however, knows exactly how to go to work to select and draw to itself just the elements needed to build up the single cell. Then, taking up its abode in that cell, using it as a basis of operations, it proceeds to duplicate its previous performance, and so cell after cell is added, by the simple reproductive process of division and subdivision, the primitive and elemental sex process, until the mighty plant is built up. From the humblest vegetable organism up to the greatest oak, the process is the same. And it does not stop there. The body of man is also built up in just this way. And he has this vegetative mind also within him, below the plane of consciousness, of course. To many this thought of a vegetative mind may be somewhat startling. But let us remember that every part of our body has been built up from the vegetable cell. The unborn child starts with the coalition of two cells. These cells begin to build up the new body for the occupancy of the child, that is, the mind principle in the cells directs the work, of course drawing upon the body of the mother for nourishment and supplies. The nourishment in the mother's blood, which supplies the material for the building up of the child's body, is obtained by the mother eating and assimilating the vegetable cells of plants, directly or indirectly. If she eats fruit, nuts, vegetables, etc., she obtains the nourishment of the plant life directly. If she eats meat, she obtains it indirectly, 
for the animal from which the meat was taken built up the meat from vegetables. There is no two ways about this. All nourishment of the animal and human kingdom is obtained from the vegetable kingdom, directly or indirectly. And the cell action in the child is identical with the cell action in the plant. Cells constantly reproducing themselves and building themselves up into bodily organs, parts, etc., under the direction and guidance of the mind principle. The child grows in this way until the hour of birth. It is born, and then the process is but slightly changed. The child begins to take nourishment either from the mother's milk or from the milk of the cow or other forms of food and as it grows larger it partakes of many different varieties of food, but always it obtains building material from the cell life of the plants. And this great building up process is intelligent, purposeful, to a wonderful degree. Man, with his boasted intellect, cannot explain the real thingness of the process. A leading scientist who placed the egg of a small lizard under microscopical examination and then watched it slowly develop has said that it seemed as if some hand was tracing the outlines of the tiny vertebrae and then building up around it think for a moment of the development of the germ within the egg of the hummingbird or the ant or the gnat or the eagle every second a change may be noticed the germ cell draws to itself nourishment from the other part of the egg, and then it grows and reproduces another cell. Then both cells divide, then subdivide, until there are millions and millions and millions of cells. And all the while the building up process continues, and the bird or insect assumes shape and form, until at last the work is accomplished and the young bird emerges from the egg and the work thus commenced continues until the death of the animal. For there is a constant using up and breaking down of cell and tissue, which the organism must replace. And so the vegetative mind of the plant, or insect, or animal, or man, is constantly at work, building up new cells from the food, throwing out worn out and used up material from the system. Not only this, but it attends to the circulation of the blood in order that the materials for the building up may be carried to all parts of the system. It attends to the digestion and assimilation of the food, the wonderful work of the organs of the body. It attends to the healing of wounds, the fight against disease, the care of the physical body, and all this out of the plane of consciousness. In the infant man, the animal world, the vegetable kingdom, ever at work, untiring, intelligent, wonderful. And this plane of mind is in man as well as in the plant, and it does its work without aid from the conscious part of man, although man may interfere with it by adverse conscious thought, which seems to paralyze its efforts. Mental healing is merely the restoring of normal conditions, so that this part of the body may do its work without the hindrance of adverse conscious thought. On this plane of the mind is found all of the vital functions and operations. The work is done out of consciousness, and the consciousness is aware of this part of the mind only when it makes demands upon the conscious for food, etc., on this plane also resides the elementary instinct that tends toward reproduction and sexual activity. The demand of this part of the mind is always increase and multiply, and according to the stage of growth of the individual is the mandate carried out, as we shall see presently. The elementary impulses and desires that we find rising into the field of consciousness come from this plane of the mind hunger, thirst, and the reproductive desires are its messages to the higher parts of the mind. And these messages are natural and free from the abuses and prostitution 
often observed attached to them by the intellect of man in connection with his unrestrained animal impulses. Gluttony and unnatural lust arise not from the primitive demand of this plane of the mind, for the lower animals even are free from them to a great extent, but it is reserved for man to so prostitute these primitive natural tendencies in order to gratify unnatural and artificial appetites, which serve to frustrate nature rather than to aid her. As life advanced in the scale and animal forms appeared on the scene, new planes of mind were unfolded in accordance to the necessity of the living forms. The animal was compelled to hunt for his food, to prey upon other forms, and to avoid being preyed upon by others. He was compelled to struggle for the unfoldment of latent powers of his mind that would give him means to play his part in the scheme of life. He was compelled to do certain things in order to live and reproduce his kind. And he demanded not in vain. For there came to him slowly an unfolding knowledge of the things necessary for the requirements of his life. We call this instinct. But, pray remember, by instinct we do not mean the still higher something that is really rudimentary intellect that we notice in the higher animals. We are speaking now of the unreasoning instinct observed in the lower animals, and to a certain degree in man. This instinctive plane of mentality causes the bird to build its nest before its eggs are laid, which instructs the animal mother how to care for its young when born and after birth, which teaches the bee to construct its cell and to store up its honey. These and countless other things in animal life and in the higher form of plant life are manifestations of instinct, that great plane of the mind. In fact, the greater part of the life of the animal is instinctive, although the higher forms of animals have developed something like rudimentary intellect or reason, which enables them to meet new conditions where intellect alone fails them. And man has this plane of mind within him, below consciousness. In fact, the lower forms of human life manifest but little intellect, and live almost altogether according to their instinctive impulses and desires. Every man has this instinctive mental region within him, and from it are constantly arising impulses and desires to perplex and annoy him, as well as to serve him occasionally. The whole secret consists in whether the man has mastery of his lower self or not. From this plane of the mind arises the hereditary impulses coming down from generations of ancestors, reaching back to the cavemen and still further back into the animal kingdom. A queer storehouse is this. Animal instincts, passion, appetites, desires, feelings, sensations, emotions, etc., are there. Hate, envy, jealousy, revenge, the lust of the animal seeking the gratification of his sexual impulses, etc., etc., are there, and are constantly intruding upon our intention until we have asserted our mastery. And often the failure to assert this mastery comes from an ignorance of the nature of the desire, etc. We have been taught that these thoughts were bad without being told why, and we have feared them and thought them the promptings of an impure nature, or a depraved mind, etc. This is all wrong. These things are not bad of themselves. They came to us honestly. They are our heritage from the past. They belong to the animal part of our nature, and were necessary to the animal in his stage of development. We have the whole menagerie within us, but that does not mean that we should turn the beasts loose upon ourselves or others. It was necessary for the animal to be fierce, full of fight, passionate, regardless of the rights of others, etc. But we have outgrown that stage of development, and it is ignoble for us to return to it or to allow it to master us. 
This lesson is not intended as a discourse upon ethics or morals. We do not intend going into a discussion of the details of right and wrong, for we have touched upon that phase of the subject in other works. But we feel justified in calling your attention to the fact that the human mind intuitively recognizes the rightness of the living up to that which comes to us from the highest parts of the mind, the highest product of our enfoldment. And it likewise intuitively recognizes the wrongness of the falling back into that which belongs to the lower stages of our mentality, to the animal part of us. That is our heritage from the past, and that which has gone before. While we may be puzzled about many details of morals and ethics, and may not be able to explain why we consider certain things right or wrong, we still intuitively feel that the highest right of which we are capable is the acting out of that which is coming to us from the highest pole of our mental being, and that the lowest wrong consists in doing that which carries us back to the life of the lower animals, in so far as mentality is concerned. Not because there is anything absolutely wrong in the mental processes and consequence of the animals in themselves. They are all right and perfectly natural in the animals. But we intuitively recognize that for us to fall back to the animal stage is a going backward in the scale of evolution. We intuitively shrink at the exhibition of brutality and animality on the part of a man or woman. We may not know just why, but a little reflection will show us that it is a sinking in the evolutionary scale against which the spiritual part of us revolts and protests. But this must not be construed to mean that the advanced soul looks upon the animal world with disgust or horror. On the contrary, there is nowhere to be found a higher respect for animal life and being than among the yogi and other advanced souls. They delight in watching the animals filling their places in life, playing out their parts in the divine scheme of life. Their animal passions and desires are actions viewed sympathetically and lovingly by the advanced soul and nothing wrong or disgusting is seen there and even the coarseness and brutality of the savage races are so regarded by these advanced souls they see everything as natural according to the grade and degree of development of these people it is only when these advanced souls view the degeneracies of civilized life that they feel sorrow and pain for here they see instances of devolution instead of evolution, degeneration instead of regeneration and advancement. And not only do they know this to be the fact, but the degenerate specimens of mankind themselves feel and know it. Compare the expression of the animal or savage going through their natural life actions and performances. See how free and natural are their expressions, how utterly apart are evidences of wrongdoing. They have not as yet found out the fatal secret of good and evil. They have not as yet eaten the forbidden fruit. But, on the contrary, look into the faces of the degenerates and fallen souls of our civilized life. See the furtive glance and the self-consciousness of wrong evident in every face. And this consciousness of wrong bears heavily upon these people. It is heavier than the punishments heaped upon them. That nameless something called conscience may be smothered for a while, but sooner or later it comes to light and demands the pound of flesh from its victim. And yet you will say that it seems hard to think that the same thing can be right in one person and wrong in another. This seems like a hard saying and a dangerous doctrine, but it is the truth, and man instinctively recognizes it. He does not expect the same sense of moral responsibility in a young child or in a savage that he does in a mature, developed, civilized man. He may restrain the child and the savage 
for self-protection and the welfare of all, but he realizes the distinction, or at least should do so. And not only is this true, but as man advances in the scale, he casts off many ideas of wrong that he once held, having outgrown the old ideas, and having grown into new conceptions. And the tendency is always upward and onward. The tendency is constantly from force and restraint toward love and freedom. The ideal condition would be one in which there were no laws and no necessity for them, a condition in which men had ceased to do wrong because they had outgrown the desire rather than from fear or restraint or force. And while this condition as yet seems afar off, there is constantly going on an unfoldment of higher planes and faculties of the mind, which when once fully manifest in the race will work a complete revolution in ethics and laws and government, and for the better, of course. In the meantime, mankind moves along, doing the best it can, making a steady, though slow, progress. End of section 20. Section 21 of a series of lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramacharaka. Section 21. The Ninth Lesson The Mental Planes. Part 2. There is another plane of the mind which is often called the instinct, but which is but a part of the plane of the intellect, although its operations are largely below the field of consciousness. We allude to what may be called the habit mind in order to distinguish it from the instinctive plane. The difference is this. The instinctive plane of mind is made up of the ordinary operations of the mind, below the plane of the intellect, and yet above the plane of the vegetative mind, and also of the acquired experiences of the race, which have been transmitted by hereditary, etc., but the habit mind contains only that which has been placed there by the person himself and which he has acquired by experience, habit, and observation, repeated so often until the mind knows it so well that it is carried below the field of consciousness and becomes second nature and akin to instinct. The textbooks upon psychology are filled with illustrations and examples of the habit phase or plane of the mental operations, and we do not think it necessary to repeat instances of the same kind here. Everyone is familiar with the fact that tasks which at first are learned only by considerable work and time soon become fixed in some part of the mind until their repetition calls for little or no exercise of conscious mental operation. In fact, some writers have claimed that no one really learns how to perform a task until he can perform it almost automatically. The pupil, who in the early stages of piano playing, finds it most difficult to control and manage his fingers, after a time is able to forget all about his fingering and devote his entire attention to the pages of his music, and after this he is able to apparently let his fingers play the entire piece of music by themselves without a thought on his part. The best performers have told us that in the moments of their highest efforts they are aware that the out-of-conscious portion of their mind is doing the work for them, and they are practically standing aside and witnessing the work being done. So true is this that in some cases it is related that if the performer's conscious mind attempts to take up the work the quality is impaired and the musician and the audience notice the difference. The same thing is true in the case of the woman learning to operate the sewing machine. It is quite difficult at first, but gradually it grows to run itself. Those who have mastered the typewriter have had the same experience. At first, each letter had to be picked out with care and effort. After a gradual improvement, the operator is enabled to devote her entire attention to the copy and let the fingers pick out the keys for themselves. 
Many operators learn rapid typing by so training the habit mind that it picks out the letter keys by reason of their position, the letters being covered over in order to force the mind to adapt itself to the new requirements. A similar state of affairs exists wherever men or women have to use tools of any kind. The tool soon is recognized by the mind and used as if it were a part of the body, and no more conscious thought is devoted to the manipulation than we devote to the operation of walking, which, by the way, is learned by the child only by the expenditure of time and labor. It is astonishing how many things we do automatically in this way. Writers have called our attention to the fact that the average man cannot consciously inform you how he puts on his coat in the morning, which arm goes in first, how the coat is held, etc. But the habit mind knows, knows very well. Let the student stand up and put on his coat in the regular way, following the leadings of the habit mind. Then, after removing it, let him attempt to put it on by inserting the other arm first, for instance. He will be surprised to find how awkward it will be for him, and how completely he has been depending upon the habit mind. And tomorrow morning, let him find out which shoe the habit mind has been putting on him first, and then try to reverse the order, and notice how flurried and disturbed the habit mind will become, and how frantically it will signal to the conscious mind, something wrong up there, or try to button on your collar, reversing the order in which the tabs are placed over the button, right before left, or left before right, as the case may be, and notice the involuntary protest, or Try to reverse the customary habit in walking and attempt to swing your right arm with the movement of your right leg, and so on, and you will find it will require the exercise of great willpower. Or try to change hands and use your knife and fork. But we must stop giving examples and illustrations. Their number is countless. Not only does the habit mind attend to physical actions, etc., but it also takes a hand in our mental operations. We soon acquire the habit of ceasing to consciously consider certain things, and the habit mind takes the matter for granted, and therefore we will think automatically on those particular questions, unless we are shaken out of the habit by a rude jolt from the mind of someone else or from the presentation of some conflicting idea occasioned by our own experience or reasoning processes. And the habit mind hates to be disturbed and compelled to reverse its ideas. It fights against it and rebels, and the result is that many of us are slaves to old, outgrown ideas that we realize are false and untrue, but which we find that we cannot exactly get rid of. In our future lessons, we will give methods to get rid of these old, outgrown ideas. There are other planes of mind which have to do with the phenomena known as psychic, by which is meant the phases of psychic phenomena, known as clairvoyance, psychometry, telepathy, etc. But we shall not consider them in this lesson, for they belong to another part of the general subject. We have spoken of them in a general way in our 14 lessons in yogi philosophy, etc. And now we come to the plane of mind known to us as intellect or the reasoning faculties. Webster defines the word intellect as follows. The part or faculty of the human soul by which it knows as distinguished from the power to feel and to will, the thinking faculty the understanding. The same authority defines the word reason as follows. The faculty or capacity of the human mind by which it is distinguished from the intelligence of the inferior animals. We shall not attempt to go into a consideration of the conscious intellect, for to do so 
we would be compelled to take up the space of the remaining lessons of the course, and besides, the student may find extended information on this subject in any of the textbooks on psychology. Instead, we will consider other faculties and planes of mind which the said textbooks pass by rapidly, or perhaps deny. And one of these planes is that of unconscious reasoning, or intellect. To many, this term will seem paradoxical, but students of the unconscious will understand just what is meant. Reasoning is not necessarily conscious in its operations. In fact, a greater part of the reasoning processes are performed below or above the conscious field. In our last lesson, we have given a number of examples proving this fact, but a few more remarks may not be out of place, nor without interest to the student. In our last lesson, you will see many instances stated in which the subconscious field of the intellect worked out problems, and then, after a time, handed to the conscious reason the solution of the matter. This has occurred to many of us, if not indeed to all of us. Who has not endeavored to solve a problem or question of some sort, and after giving it up, has had it suddenly answered and flashed into consciousness when least expected? The experience is common to the race. While the majority of us have noticed these things, we have regarded them as exceptional and out of the general rule. Not so, however, with students of the mental planes. The latter have recognized these planes of reason and have availed themselves of their knowledge by setting these unconscious faculties to work for them. In our next lesson, we will give directions to our students regarding this accomplishment, which may prove of the greatest importance to those who will take the trouble to practice the directions given. It is a plan that is known to the majority of men who have done things in the world, the majority of them, however, having discovered the plan for themselves as the result of a need or demand upon the inner powers of mind. The plane of mind, immediately above that of intellect, is that known as intuition. Intuition is defined by Webster as follows direct apprehension or cognition, immediate knowledge, as in perception or consciousness, involving no reasoning process, quick or ready insight or apprehension. It is difficult to explain just what is meant by intuition, except to those who have experienced it, and these people do not need the explanation. Intuition is just as real a mental faculty as is intellect, or, to be more exact, is just as much a collection of mental faculties. Intuition is above the field of consciousness, and its messages are passed downward, though its processes are hidden. The race is gradually unfolding into the plane of intuition and the race will some day pass into full consciousness on that plane. In the meantime, it gets but flashes and glimpses from the hidden region. Many of the best things we have come from that region. Art, music, the love of the beautiful and good poetry, the higher form of love, spiritual insight to a certain degree, intuitive perception of truth, etc., etc., come from this region. These things are not reasoned out by the intellect, but seem to spring full-born from some unknown region of the mind. In this wonderful region dwells genius. Many, if not all, of the great writers, poets, musicians, artists, and other examples of genius have felt that their power came to them from some higher source. Many have thought that it emanated from some being kindly to them, who would inspire them with power and wisdom. Some transcendent power seemed to have been called into operation, and the worker would feel that his product or creation 
was not his handiwork, but that of some outside intelligence. The Greeks recognized this something in man and called it man's demon. Plutarch, in his discourse on the demon that guided Socrates, speaks of the vision of Timarchus, who, in the case of Trophonius, saw spirits which were partly attached to human bodies, and partly over and above them, shining luminously over their heads. He was informed by the oracle that the part of the spirit which was immersed in the body was called the soul, but that the outer and unimmersed portion was called the demon. The oracle also informed him that every man has his demon, whom he is bound to obey. Those who implicitly follow that guidance are the prophetic souls, the favorites of the gods. Goethe also spoke of the demon as a power higher than the will, and which inspired certain natures with miraculous energy. We may smile at these conceptions, but they are really very close to the truth. The higher regions of the mind, while belonging to the individual and a part of himself, are so far above his ordinary consciousness that to all intents and purposes messages from them are as orders from another and higher soul. But still the voice is that of the I, speaking through its sheaths as best it is able. This power belongs to every one of us, although it manifests only in the degree that we are able to respond to it. It grows by faith and confidence, and closes itself up and withdraws into its recesses when we doubt it and would question its veracity and reality. What we call originality comes from this region. The intuitive faculties pass on to the conscious mind some perception of truth higher than the intellect has been able to work out for itself, and lo, it is called the work of genius. The advanced occultist knows that in the higher regions of the mind are locked up intuitive perceptions of all truth, and that he who can gain access to these regions will know everything intuitively, and as a matter of clear sight, without reasoning or explanation. The race has not as yet reached the heights of intuition. It is just beginning to climb the foothills but it is moving in the right direction. It will be well for us if we will open ourselves to the higher inner guidance and be willing to be led by the Spirit. This is a far different thing from being led by outside intelligence, which may or may not be qualified to lead. But the Spirit within each of us has our interests at heart and is desirous of our best good and is not only ready but willing to take us by the hand and lead us on. The higher self is doing the best it can for our development and welfare, but is hampered by the confining sheaths. And alas, many of us glory in these sheaths and consider them the highest part of ourselves. Do not be afraid to let the light of the Spirit pierce through these confining sheaths and dissolve them. The intuition, however, is not the spirit, but is one of its channels of communication to us. There are other and still higher planes of mind, but the intuition is the one next in the line of unfoldment, and we should open ourselves to its influence and welcome its unfoldment. Above the plane of intuition is that of the cosmic knowing, upon which we will find the consciousness of the oneness of all. We have spoken of this plane in our lesson on the unfoldment of consciousness. When one is able to conscious on this plane, this exalted plane of mind, he is able to see fully, plainly, and completely that there is one great life underlying all the countless forms and shapes of manifestation. He is able to see that separateness is only the working fiction of the universe. He is able to see that each ego is but a center of consciousness in the great ocean of life, all in pursuance of the divine plan, 
and that he is moving forward toward higher and higher planes of manifestation, power, and individuality in order to take a greater and grander part in the universal work and plans. The cosmic knowing in its fullness has come to but few of the race, but many have had glimpses more or less clear of its transcendent wonder, and others are on the borderland of this plane. The race is unfolding gradually, slowly but surely, and those who have had this wonderful experience are preparing others for a like experience. The seed is being sown, and the harvest will come later. This and other phases of the higher forms of consciousness are before the race. The individuals who read this lesson are perhaps nearer to it than they think. Their interest in the lessons is an indication of that hunger of the soul which is a prophecy of the satisfaction of the cry for spiritual bread. The law of life heeds these cries for aid and nourishment, and responds accordingly, but along the lines of the highest wisdom and according to the real requirements of the individual. Let us close this lesson with a quotation from Light on the Path, which bears directly upon the concluding thought. Read it carefully, and let it sink down deep into your inner consciousness, and you will feel the thrill of joy that comes to him who is nearing the goal. Look for the flower to bloom in the silence that follows the storm, not till then. It shall grow, it will shoot up, it will make branches and leaves, and form buds while the storm lasts but not until the entire personality of the man is dissolved and melted, not until it is held by the divine fragment which has created it, as a mere subject for grave experiment and experience, not until the whole nature has yielded and become subject unto its higher self can the bloom open. Then will come a calm, such as comes in a tropical country after the heavy rain when nature works so swiftly that one may see her action. Such a calm will come to the harassed spirit. And in the deep silence the mysterious event will occur which will prove that the way has been found. Call it by whatever name you will. It is a voice that speaks where there is none to speak. It is a messenger that comes, a messenger without form or substance, or it is the flower of the soul that has opened. It cannot be described by any metaphor, but it can be felt after, looked for, and desired, even among the raging of the storm. The silence may last a moment of time, or it may last a thousand years, but it will end. Yet you will carry its strength with you. Again and again the battle must be fought and won, it is only for an interval that nature can be still. The concluding three lessons of this series will be devoted to a practical course of instruction in the development of the hidden planes of the mind, or rather, in the development of the power of the individual to master the same and make use of them in his life. He will be taught to master the lower principles, not only in the surmounting of them, but in the transmitting of the elemental forces toward his higher ends. Power may be obtained from this part of the mind, under the direction of the will, and the student will be told how to set the unconscious intellect to work for him, and he will be told how to develop and train the will. We have now passed the line between the theoretical and the practical phases of the subject, and from now on, it will be a case of train, develop, cultivate, and apply. Knowing what lies back of it all, the student is now prepared to receive the instructions which he might have misused before. Peace be with thee all. Mantram. Affirmation. I am the master of my soul. End of section 21.